Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech doing a Plane Chase 2012 review here. Spent a good amount of time this last weekend playing with the new cards that came out in Plane Chase and definitely enjoy several of them. It's worth noting that unlike previous Plane Chases where it was just reprints of cards, Plane Chase 2012 has 21 new cards. Now they've definitely continued reprinting some of the staple cards directly inside of these decks. I was happy to see cards like Inky Ink Eyes, which is $10 in and of itself, or Ghostly Prison, which is a staple in EDH decks, get printed as part of these. Blood Braid Elf was also nice to see as a two of, considering that he is a staple in Modern, which help keep, keeps the Modern format accessible to people. But what I really want to focus on is the new cards that have been printed that are causing a lot of excitement in the Eternal and in the EDH environments. I'm going to be using a rating system, which I'd like to thank LSV from Channel Fireball for, on how playable these cards are. Five are just amazing, incredible cards. Uh, four uh, are cards that are going to be staples in any format and strongly recommend picking up. But three are kind of your archetypal middle cards that are playable in a specific type of deck. Two kind of fit a niche cards, which is actually where a lot of EDH cards will fall into. One probably won't see play in zero. I kind of wonder why Wizards printed these cards as they're barely playable, if not entirely unplayable in a constructed area. Let's move on to the decks. We've got a bunch of cards to look at here, 21 in total. The Jun deck, I actually really like the design of this deck, but don't believe the cards to be very playable with the with a single exception from it. I do like the synergy between the deck, and if you just want to play Plane Chase for fun, this is worth checking out and playing as an individual deck, but not really for its Eternal or EDH cards. The Part of the problem with these cards is they're a little bit underwhelming from the power perspective on them for EDH or Eternal. A 2 casting cost 1-1 one, one is not that great. It does fit the theme in that you get a 3-3 three, three when he dies. In both EDH and Eternal, though, you've got a lot of removal that includes exiling, and a 1-1 one, one for 2 is not an to really worry about somebody attacking with it. So he's likely just to stick around. And given the large number of cards that I'm going over, if the card really isn't playable in Eternal just based on the casting costs versus the, the power and toughness that comes out of it, I'm going to just move on to why it's playable and eat or not playable in EDH. Paralyzer Dragon is a really good theme based dragon card for EDH, the Devourer ability, putting a bunch of plus one, plus ones on him, followed by allowing you to do damage whenever he attacks, can break up an EDH game. This card is definitely going to see some play in my Reign of Dragons EDH deck, and is the kind of design that I really like to see out of EDH cards from Wizards. Thanks for putting this in there. Beetleback Chief is a card that I'm really divided on at this point. I love him for EDH. Goblins need a little bit more of that mid-range four or five casters to make the theme very playable in an EDH deck. They're a little bit on the small side at this point for large multiplayer games. This card could also be playable in the Eternal format. Goblin War Marshal, which I'm currently playing in my Legacy Goblin deck, has a five casting cost. Doesn't work so well with your mana curve where you're trying to limit your amount of mana or ether vials putting them up to five you often feel bad about that because you just want it back down to four this card may work very well in a goblin legacy deck worth checking out also remember the uncommons in this set are printed as a two of so if you need a play set you only have to pick up two of the decks or you can easily trade off the other cards that are in the decks for your other two Dragon Lair Spider, not impressive at all. The ability to go 1-1 one, one every time somebody casts a spell is decent, but I was hoping for something a bit stronger here, since he's in that Titan casting cost area of a 6 casting cost, double for two different colors, should be a little bit stronger than a Titan, given how difficult he's going to be to cast. And I definitely don't think that reaching a bunch of 1-1s one, is really worth it. Although we'll give him a try, maybe replace him over Verdant Force in my red-green deck and see if he works out. 
Thormok, the Insatiable, is a wonderful card for those who are interested in a Timmy Commander. The X Devour X is great. Uh, think about having a board state with Brawn and Anger out, a few other small 1-1s or 2-2s. Devour them all and end up making a 16-16 for just devouring four. The cumulative effect on this is great. He is a bit on the fragile side, so hopefully you've got a way to protect him or you're just going to lose your entire board. But I like the theme of him. Nice artwork, very playable in EDH. Moving on to Savage Auras. This is a well-designed theme deck uh, with not as many playable cards as we're going to see in the last two decks. The Dream Pod Druid is kind of a mini verdant force in that you get little 1-1s one as long as he's enchanted during each player's upkeep. Could be playable in a very limited way in an EDH deck, not playable in Eternal, even though he's a 2-2 two, two for 1. The Having to put an enchantment on him makes him very, very fragile. Elderwood Scion is also a little bit on the light side, a 5 casting cost for a 4-4. Four, four. He's got Trample and Life Link, both great abilities for EDH, and the ability to drop down the cost of enchantments, although he's once again pretty um, fragile. If he had Hexproof instead of the causing targets to spend two more mana, he would be incredibly playable in EDH. Iridark Umbra is a solid EDH card for this particular type of theme of deck. Plus four, plus four, and first strike with Totem Armor is good. Six casting costs is still a little high, and I'll be avoiding him myself. Feldar Umbra is one of the best cards that was put forward in these sets. A two casting cost Umbra that gives life link is good. The ability to bounce it from creature to creature is incredible, and totem armor on top of that is great. I can possibly see this even making it into an Enchantress or a Maverick deck in Eternal, where I'm going to be playtesting it myself. This deck may be worth picking up for this Umbra alone, although this last card, Cordon the Dawnclad, is also well worth picking up this deck. Flying Vigilance 6-6 six, six, and an ability that is so needed in EDH, the ability to exile permanence, is incredible. All you have to do is enchant him, build an enchantment deck around him, and you'll be extremely happy with him as a commander. Once again, not playable in Eternal, given the casting cost and the abilities just aren't crushing for a 6 caster, but great for EDH. Recommend picking him up as an EDH commander. I may even be building a deck that I'll talk about later to post up here around him. Next deck we're looking at is actually my favorite, Chaos Reigns. This deck has several playable cards, although Fractured Power Stone is not among them. This is the type of card I think the wizard really need, wizards needs to avoid. A zero... Uh, Zero playability outside of plane chase does not make me want to use it, and the rolling the planar die basically saves you a little bit of mana uh, to get that free roll, although I'd much rather have a soul ring or even a two casting cost tap for 2-2 two, two artifact that would be playable in EDH and Eternal by far. The rest of the cards, though, in this deck are fortunately extremely playable in EDH, and even in Eternal, Mass Mutiny is incredibly good for red. This is a mini insurrection and will break up a lot of games early, giving red another nice attacking card in its toolbox. Etherhorn Sorcerer has Cascade at the 6th spot, which is great against counter spells, and the ability to return it to hand is extremely nice. Casting cost can even be brought down as it's an artifact pretty easily in blue and red. Great card, look forward to playing it in EDH. Illusionary Angel has a little bit of potential in EDH as a 4-4, but has a lot of potential in Eternal. 3 casting costs 4-4 four, four Flyer, where the only drawback is having to cast another spell. That's pretty easy to do in Eternal formats with a little bit of mana acceleration or a Gix Probe. This will be a great blocker to Delvers or even Tarmogoyfs. 
before they get too large. I look forward to trying this in several decks in both EDH, but mostly in Eternal formats. Shardless Agent is another wonderful card, extremely playable in EDH. One of the problems with smaller casters in EDH is that they usually don't have an incredible value to them. Cascade makes this extremely valuable, allowing you to cascade into maybe a two casting cost ramp spell or a ponder or a brainstorm. And then the Eternal. This card is already seeing play in Vintage in a Hyper Genesis deck, being able to cascade into it. I would even consider playing this in a Bant deck, where the utility of having two cards is wonderful. Definitely recommend trading for this card. It's my favorite card out of the set. Maelstrom Wanderer happens to be my favorite of the commanders out of this set. Each of these decks clearly has one EDH playable commander card, and this one is so much better than the others. An eight caster may seem a little bit difficult until you notice that green's in the casting cost. I mean, I even would have been happy to see this as a five color commander. Creatures you control have haste is a wonderful ability when you're going to double cascade at eight casting cost. I have already seen a deck put together by my partner Marguerite that is just crushingly good. The playability is also there in the eternal format where uh, putting him out along with a bunch of other big creatures with something like Hyper Genesis gives them all haste, means that you win that turn instead of the next. And if the game happens to stall out because of counter spells, casting him at eight casting cost means that they must have three counter spells available, or you're going to at least get those two cascade items out, even if he gets countered. Last deck we're going to look at has been the most popular so far, and it's already up to about $25, $30 at some stores where it retails for. 20 or could be pre-ordered for 17 or 18. This is the Ninja deck. Ninja deck has some wonderful cards outside of the Psy uh, of Shinobi. And looking at the artwork, I was hoping this would be a mini Chite, and it's definitely not at only plus one, plus one, and no real useful extra abilities. But let's not dwell too long here, because the other cards in this deck are definitely great. Silent Blade of Oni is a 6-5 with Ninjutsu 6 that allows you to cast things out of your opponent's hand. This is great to play against that blue player who is sitting there with too many useful spells after everybody else at the table has dropped theirs, their hands. Wonderful EDH card. Veil of the Nightclad, I've already had used against me as a commander. Intimidate to all of your creatures means that the game is going to move forward and that you don't end up with a wall of creatures stopping your smaller ninjas from attacking. Great commander, very happy to see it. Also, very good artwork. Baleful Strix is extremely playable in EDH. Once again, it gives you a nice advantage for that two casting cost spot of getting an, an additional card, and it stops people from attacking you as a flying death toucher, means that your opponents become a much better target to go after. In Eternal, this may also be playable. This would be a nice blocker for a Tarmogoyf or a Delver while getting you card advantage early on. I look forward to playing this in both formats. Sakashima Student is also a wonderful clone that's been put forward in this set. It may look a little bit weak initially when you look at the casting cost as a four casting cost clone. Until you notice the ninjutsu cost for just two, you can sneak this individual into play, copy anything out there on the field uh, with another, with some creatures with comes into play effects. This is extremely useful in EDH and may even be useful in Eternal. This one card is worth buying the entire ninja set, so give it a try. Enjoy playing it in EDH. This has been Brian Rowe with the Plain Chase 2012 review. Please leave me any comments on your thoughts on the cards. Tell me where I got it right or where I got it wrong or what you'd like to see in future reviews. Thanks.